We are finishing the first year of the podcast Forgotten Sound of Flamenco, and in the last episode of the season, number 26, we will review how the first 25 episodes have gone and what reception is having in many countries. We will also remember some persons, stories, and sound that have been protagonists during this season. Ah, and you will know what's the beautiful music we can hear at the beginning and at the end of each episode. <laughs> Sounds that once were listened. Sounds that once were enjoyed. Sounds that once were danced. Sounds relegated to oblivion. And yet, there is still something we can do for them. Let us summon them. Let us summon them. Welcome to the podcast Forgotten Sounds of Flamenco. My name is Jose Miguel Hernández Jaramillo and I invite you to enroll in this journey through the sounds, stories, spaces and people that were part of the 19th century flamenco. Hello, how are you? I am very grateful you are there listening to this episode. I hope you enjoy it. I will dedicate it to commenting on some impressions about the first season of this podcast. And the word thank you will be very present. Thank you because together we have been able to get here, after 25 episodes in English and another 25 in Spanish in the sister podcast Sonidos Olvidados del Flamenco. I think it is time to do a little retrospective of everything that has happened in this year. I am delighted with the reception that the podcast has had in the almost 50 different countries from where you listen to it. For many days, we have been in the ranking of the 10 most listened to iTunes podcasts in music history category in several countries such as Spain, Brazil, Japan, Mexico, Switzerland, Finland, Guatemala, Panama, Malta or Australia. And in some of these countries, we have even become number one. So thank you so much. As you probably know, I have been researching for 26 years, more than half my life, how this wonderful music that is flamenco emerged in the 19th century. I was thinking about the possibility of socializing affordably some of the beautiful stories that I was finding in my research work. It was at the beginning of December of last year when I decided to launch this podcast on a flight I took forward to Dortmund in Germany. On that flight, I made a list of possible episodes I could talk about and it turned out that with that list, I would have big weekly episodes covered until the end of 2026. I began to outline the first episode in Germany and returning to Spain, I began to record them. For me, the perfect day to inaugurate this podcast was January 6, 2023, since that day marked precisely 200 years since the first news that we know so far about the Petenera. Lenny Carreyes and I have already dedicated many years to Petenera's research, and that day we had to celebrate this symbolically. Well, that's how I began this journey, with that tribute to the Mexican Petenera dance on the Coliseo Theater. In another episode, I could even start the podcast from the Mexican Coliseum itself, or rather from the building that occupies the site where this theater was located a couple centuries ago. I dedicated a few more episodes to the Peteneras this year and those that remain because a podcast could be made of the Petenera just to talk about the thousand stories about it, each one more amazing. I also dedicated a few episodes to talk about another exceptional song for me to which I dedicated my doctoral dissertation in ethnomusicology because this song also serves as a bridge between my land, Andalusia, and the sister lands of Cuba and Mexico and other American countries like Colombia or Venezuela. I am referring to the Guajira, how it arrived from America about 145 years ago and how it was welcomed and adapted in Spain particularly in flamenco. The Guajira was a song that in those first years of presence among us undoubtedly had a very significant symbolic meaning in the people in Spain due to the rumor already suspected of the end of the Spanish colonial period and its consummation in 1898. By the way, fortunately for all terrible things it entails, the lyrics of the first Guajiras reveal this mixture, something showing almost utopical, paradisiacal Cuban landscapes, and on the other hand, the sadness due to the defeat in the war of independence. 
There are other flamenco palos to which I also dedicated some episodes, such as Fandango or Malagueñas, based on the research work of Lenica Reyes, or to the Jaleo. The Jaleo stopped being sung in flamenco in the first decades of the 20th century. I also dedicate an episode to the Colombiana, that is one of the most recent palos incorporated into flamenco 90 years ago. I commented how it arrived in Spain during the Ibero-American exhibition in Seville in 1929. This information was unknown in flamenco until now, as well as the name of the people who brought it, the Colombian duo Wills and Escobar. Although they sang a Mexican song which Pepe Marchena heard and based on it created the Colombiana, the name Colombiana was not as random as flamencology says, but actually has something to do with Colombia. I have also dedicated some episodes to showing some of the spaces in which 19th century flamenco was present, and that seems surprising to us today. For example, in religious processions, in large theaters within work of Genero Chico, or sung by blind people for whom flamenco singing was their way of subsistence, in a society that still did not allow them access to other job possibilities. I also dedicated some episodes to some people who, in a way or another, had relevance in the flamenco scene, such as the Hungarian virtuoso pianist Oscar de la China, who ended up living among us in Andalusia and made incredible flamenco compositions for piano a century and a half ago. Another memorable episode was the one I dedicated to Don Francisco Amate. If you remember, Amate was an amateur singer who, by chance, was in the right place at the right time for his voice to be recorded on wax cylinders in the early years of the 20th century. I would dare say this recording represents one of the most transcendental elements in understanding how flamingo was sung before commercial recordings appeared, because, as I mentioned in that episode, he's probably singing repertoire from several decades before these recordings appeared. You will not find Oscar de la China or Francisco Amate in any history of flamenco. However, in this podcast, they had their space because they deserve it, because of how relevant they were. Another extraordinary person to whom I dedicate episode 17 was Carmen Dauset or Dauset, according to others, better known as Carmencita. I focus on what she could be dancing in the films that Edison filmed in 1894. This research work was done by Lenica Reyes and I 12 years ago. We considered that it was an excellent moment to show Carmencita's video synchronized with the music of what she's probably dancing to, a petenera. We did a meticulous job of synchronization, almost working frame by frame, even including the sound of Carmencita's feet tapping the wooden platform on which she dances, so that you can better perceive what rhythm structures she's producing with her feet and how they fit together perfectly with the sesquialtera rhythm of the petenera. Remember that you can see this video in the YouTube channel Sonidos Olvidados en No Musicología Creativa. Precisely a petenera is what I decided to be the opening and ending music for this podcast, specifically the one titled Peteneras de Anton el Gitano, Peteneras of Anton the Gypsy. The author of this petenera is unknown and it was published for piano 140 years ago when the petenera superstition did not yet exist, fortunately. The original work is written for piano, as I mentioned, and I made an arrangement for the string quartet and piano, which sounds like this.
Beautiful Paternal Right. Finally, I dedicated a series of episodes to reflecting on some aspects that I have been working on during all these years, some of them together with Lenny Carreyes since 14th years ago, which have been fundamental in obtaining knowledge where there apparently was none. Lenica and I have specialized in a branch of ethnomusicology called historical ethnomusicology. Ultimately, we study human processes since people eventually produce music, perceive it, enjoy it, dance to it, or use it in some way in their daily lives. By focusing on music called popular or based on orality, such as flamenco, we find an added challenge concerning historical musicology that is usually based on academic music that was written. For us, that challenge is trying to know what happened to the music that was primarily not written, that was blown away by the wind, and that no longer remains in the memory of those who heard it. To face this challenge, in these years we have had to use our imagination and as ethnomusicologists of our time, we have incorporated into our research work techniques from other disciplines that we have adapted to our research problems. Sometimes we have had to propose new methodologies. All of this has given us tools unimaginable 15 years ago that allows us to obtain results that gradually complete that puzzle of 19th century flamenco in which many pieces were missing. We have applied this to flamenco and popular music from other territories, mainly from Mexico and Cuba. These new tools and methodologies that we defined have allowed me to better understand the phenomenon of flamenco and that is what I wanted to share here. For example, we have demonstrated the reliability with which much of the written music represents the popular music that was transmitted orally. This is more recognized today, not yet completely, but we were among the first in our field to work from this perspective. I dedicated an episode to this topic, vital to knowing what flamenco music was like, or at least an essential part before the recordings appeared. At the end of the 19th century, flamenco, a fashionable music phenomenon in Spain, was the subject of the production of thousands of scores of different palos. You have heard some of these scores in this podcast. Usually, they have never been recorded or performed in recent decades. So what I had to do is digitalize the scores and reproduce them using virtual instruments to make them sound as realistic as real instruments. If we ever have some fans, hiring musicians to record them will be great. Still, until that day comes, we will continue to hear them in Machine's interpretation. Another of the episodes related to all of this is the one I dedicated to providing specific keys to understanding flamenco in the 19th century. I have commented in several episodes that the history of flamenco that has been told and is still being told is different to what actually happened. Let's say that it is very biased and adapt to the ideals and interests that certain intellectual or academic authorities dictated at the time. That's why what you heard in this podcast is like to be found in these flamenco stories in schools, conservatories or university flamenco masters. For example, one of the positions that differentiated me from those stories, as I have also commented multiple times, is that in these flamenco stories, even today, linearity that we would say evolutionary has always been thought so that every song has to derive from a previous one, generally in one-to-one -one proportion. For me, it is unacceptable and erroneous simplification since the process of musical creation are very complex and diverse. I dedicated some episodes to this topic, commenting on how we can't allow things to continue being said, like, for example, that Solea or Buleria were derived from a Baroque Hakara. I also talk about the phenomenon of fusing Baroque and flamenco music. I commented that it is great to do it from the perspective of contemporary musical creation, but it is not rigorous to consider this practice as proof of these phylogenetic derivations, at least not if other arguments are not provided that meet the necessary and sufficient condition, which I explain in another episode. The ethnomusicologist, composer and musician Emil Ersayev participated in another episode talking to us about a similar phenomenon occurring in Mexico in recent decades called barrocho or fusion between baroque music and sones jarochos. 
Well, this has been a quick review of the almost six hours of podcasts that these 25 episodes of the first season last. And all the success it is having is thanks to you, especially if you subscribe for free, share the episodes or like them. All of this action helps platform algorithms where you can listen to this podcast to promote it organically and propose it to new people who in turn increase this long list of subscribers and followers that we had worldwide. That's why it's really important that you do these small actions, not only with this podcast, but with other independent culture proposals that you like. Well, let's say that we invest our time to share this kind of content for free. I hope you have unforgettable holidays and I wish you a really, really happy 2024. Thanks so much.